Hi everyone, my name is Christina Williams and I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania in the entrepreneurial track. Our panel today will be solely focused on what our panelists have learned from developing their business or in the entrepreneurial field. Our first panelist is Nandini Nag. She's multifaceted career from an accountant, auditor, management consultant, and now as a strategist who has worked 15 years in the tech industry and currently leads corporate strategy and go-to market in Hitachi and has earned an MBA in finance from the Wharton School of Business. Our second panelist is Professor Scott Manti who teaches marketing management at Harvard University School and Plymouth University. He is a certified consultant for Accreditation Council for Business Schools and Programs um, and is the recipient of Harvard Extension School's Dean's Letter of Commendation for Distinguished Teaching and is the creator of the first visitor behavior analyst software. Our final panelist is David Watt, who will be with us shortly. He is the executive chairman of Goodway Group and is the Client Relationships Manager for Goodway and provides digital marketing for Fortune 500 companies. He is also an alum at the Wharton School of Pennsylvania. Um, my first question to you guys is, what inspired you to enter the entrepreneurial world and what were your initial goals and aspirations? Nandini, Nandini, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me. Greatly uh, honored to be here with Scott and David. Um, I would say that my, firstly, I'm not an entrepreneur. I work in corporate strategy. And uh, my route to corporate strategy probably has more twists and turns than your average series on Netflix. So I started pretty, you know, stayed, as you can imagine, as an accountant. It was our family profession. I got bored after a while because I realized that's not something I really enjoy doing. Repetitive work is not my cup of tea. So then uh, at that time, fortunately for me, I'm talking about, you know, early 2000 ERP implementations were taking off uh, in India, which is where I'm from originally. And uh, I got an opportunity to do implementation for uh, Kellogg's in uh, UK and I jumped at it. So for the next 10 years or so, during my 20s, I practically lived out of a suitcase working across different countries in Europe, in Canada, in Singapore, which ultimately uh, led me to do my first MBA in Manchester Business School, UK. Uh, at that time, I wanted to move into strategy because I realized that when you do these kind of transformational projects, there's a lot of thought that goes behind it. There's a lot of investments. So I wanted to make, to wanted to influence the investment, uh, you know, the positioning, the business case that goes into it, rather than just doing the work downstream. So that was my first foray into strategy, which brought me to California in 2005 when I joined Ernst and Young. Um, I spent about five years there working with different tech firms, and uh, eventually wanted to move into industry, which is why I did my second MBA this time from Wharton. Uh, graduated in 2013. In fact, we celebrated our 10 year reunion last week. And uh, since then, I've worked in the corporate strategy function of different tech companies like Hewlett Packard, Cisco, Nokia, Landing and uh, Hitachi Ventura a couple of years back. So I would say that, you know, if you want to get into strategy, it probably makes sense to understand different parts of the business first, um, because it gives you a more well rounded view. In my case, I feel that the fact that I've lived in six countries, I've worked uh, cross-functionally, gives me a more holistic view of what strategy should be than if I had jumped into it on day one. Thank you so much. Um, Scott, would you like to share why you kind of entered the business space um, and taught academically within these fields? Sure. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate. This is such a marvelous activity and I'm honored to be with my co-presenters here. I'm not sure that I ever intended to be in this space. I think it was a matter of being open to whatever experiences presented themselves to me. And I, I learned to, rather than prejudging those circumstances and those situations, 
to just try them out and try to get a sense as to was this something that fit with me uh, rather than my having made some sort of a, a decision in, uh, ahead of time without actually having experienced it. It allowed me to try a lot of different things. It allowed me to make some choices and see how well, how well those fit with me personally. And then as time continued, I realized that the assimilation of these experiences was something that could quite reasonably be shared with students or shared with others. Uh, I started several consulting companies and enjoyed that immensely. And I realized that an extension of that was to spend time with students and to try to, in essence, rather than teaching them, I try to make every class situation more of a mentoring situation where that's being communicated to them as to how they might translate some of my experiences into something that they can use rather than the, than just necessarily the the rote presentation and so i i ended up here uh, sort of in a circuitous route but i have to tell you out of the myriad of jobs that i've had it is by far the finest job i've ever had and so i i think i'm very lucky to be in this space thank you so much um, and David, what inspired you to enter the entrepreneurial world? What were your initial goals and aspirations? Well, once again, great to be on this panel with uh, this esteemed and eclectic group. And uh, I, we all definitely have different stories. And mine is more of joining a family business. And uh, I'm actually third generation. And uh, my father, who also went to Wharton, uh, was a, uh, a serial entrepreneur and always building new things and coming up with new products within the marketing realm. And uh, our story as a company, we were started in 1929. Uh, we're going to be 100 years old in uh, uh, 2029, which is very exciting, is uh, we started as a commercial printer. And the key is, how do you stay relevant uh, for over 90 years. So I came aboard uh, when we were transitioning kind of out of commercial printing into marketing, direct response marketing, direct mail, database marketing. Uh, and this was in the, uh, after I graduated Wharton around uh, 1979. Uh, so my adventure was learning from my father, uh, getting out on the road early, like a lot of folks on this call, or starting their entrepreneurial journeys early and uh, got to pitch brands and ad agencies and come up with big creative ideas and sell programs uh, to build sales that were measurable uh, so that we could get repeat business. So yes, I learned from my dad and um, you know, in our story, uh, we always as a marketer uh, or, or marketing company follow the eyeballs. So it was kind of print, everyone was reading. Uh, we had a whole decade and a half with cable, uh, really at the outset of it being rolled out and people subscribing and getting their services. And, uh, and then our latest leap is into digital marketing and uh, much more expansive and uh, so much opportunity and so much complexity. So this is uh, in our history probably the most exciting time to be in advertising and marketing. Thank you so much. You mentioned staying relevant within the space as um, this business has been running third generations. Um, how have you navigated staying relevant within the marketplace? How have you dealt with competition, the market changes, and the strategies that you've employed? And that extends to kind of both of you as well. How have you stayed relevant within the tech industries, the strategies you employed? Wow. You want me to go first, Christina, or? Feel free. <laughs> uh, um, all right. Uh, wow, that, that was really loaded uh, and, and, I, I, and a great question. And, you know, my takeaway, and I think all the panelists would agree, is you have to stay very, very curious and you have to stay on top of uh, not only your industry, but what's happening in the marketplace, what's happening globally, 
Uh, I know in the marketing uh, world, it's a lot about privacy and use of data. Uh, Europe has taken kind of a lead on that. Uh, the US has probably 30, 40 states with their own laws. So our navigation now is we want to do the best targeting possible, uh, but uh, third party information, uh, cookie data, as you all probably know it, um, you know, that could go away in a year or two. So we are now looking at uh, contextual and other ways that we can accurately target audiences and show clients a lift in sales, a return on investment. Uh, so this is uh, an exciting time, but uh, it, it demands a lot, a lot of analytical chops, a lot of data chops. Uh, we are hiring all kinds of different talent that we didn't need five or 10 years ago with our previous business. Uh, and the last thing, just to address um, competition, uh, it seems like wherever the eyeballs go, uh, there are a lot of ad tech companies and MarTech companies that enter the space. And uh, some, some make it, some don't, some are acquired. Uh, so we do have a lot of competition uh, out there and um, that I respect. Uh, I learn from competition. It, it, it makes us a better company. Uh, if we lose a, a bid on, on, on an opportunity, I want to find out what they had that we didn't, because I always think we should win uh, almost every pitch. Uh, so yeah, competition is a good thing. Uh, it does come and go. Uh, it just seems like whoever was a, a competitor two or three or four years ago is, is irrelevant. And we have newer, smaller companies starting with great ideas and uh, that, that we're uh, trying to learn from. And then if they're if they really have something unique, then maybe sometimes you want to buy your competition. So there are two companies that we acquired recently uh, to kind of round out our arsenal. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Nandini, would you like to tackle that question next within the tax industry? Sure, sure. So just to build on a little bit of what David was saying, competition comes in all shapes and sizes, right? Especially if you're working for a company like Hitachi Ventara, which has about 900 units. Wow. And even though we don't have a present, uh, like, a, a you know, uh, we are not listed here in US, we are, it's one of the biggest companies in Japan. And it's not just Hitachi, you, you think about any tech company, uh, it's all about figuring out the, what is the signal and what is the noise. Like right now, everybody is talking about Gen AI. I mean, if people could engrave it or tattoo it on themselves, they would do that. Doesn't mean you're really doing anything, right? So, and yes, it is a, you, there's a hype cycle. This is what happened with cloud and the companies that did not wake up to the challenge of the cloud and the opportunity of the cloud lost out. Case in point, Hewlett Packard. Um, and you saw new companies emerging out of it like AWS, Google Cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, Firstly, don't underestimate the competition. Just because they are small doesn't mean they are not going to take over. And Silicon Valley is replete with uh, you know, instances like this. Companies that started small and then became big and today is worth more than entire industries. Case in point, Tesla. At some point in time, Tesla was valued at more than the entire, uh, you know, the other three automakers combined. Sure, they are catching up, but there was this lag. The other thing to keep in mind is, Figure out how the hype works for you. For example, Gen AI. Yes, we have to do something about it, but doesn't mean we, we have to be the next uh, open AI or we have to be the next NVIDIA. What is your relevance? Where, where is your uh, position in this whole ecosystem of new tech that is emerging? I think it's very important to think about that rather than just throwing money at the you know latest hip trend that comes along. So, uh, you know, researching, as David mentioned, keeping an open mind, understanding that, you know, the threat or the competition can come from anywhere and being aware of where your company or lands in this whole ecosystem. I think those things are very important to stay relevant. Thank you so much for sharing that view. Scott, would you like to add anything academically based or as your time as a consultant? So, yeah. Many times I've been brought into situations where the question to me would be, 
along the lines of from what you've just heard from my two colleague panelists, how do we take into account all of the, the dynamics going on in the industry in the various markets? I tend to start off with, well, let's start, let's begin with a relative framework. Uh, one in particular that I like has been popularized in, in, in some, of the, some of the forms of literature, and that's the five C's, the idea of the company, the collaborator, the uh, customer, the context, and the competition. And to start with that perspective, that keeps, in essence, individuals and an organization at the 40,000 foot level and then helps them flesh out some of the details as time goes on. But the idea is that how do we how do we re remain responsive to those changes that go on? Uh, for example, many times we've we've talked about how to have anticipated, if at all, the influences of the context of some sort of situation like COVID. How could we possibly have taken that into account? And so let's look at those organizations that are out there that have flourished in those circumstances versus those that have done less well. And so in essence, uh, by being able to take that framework and realizing that we needed to go back and revisit this, and as what I think David was talking about, this segmentation and targeting, you can take those five C's of that framework and begin to, or whatever framework where that works for you, revisit that, pull information together so you're reducing the trial and error and try to come up with ways of thinking in terms of what kind of value is being exchanged between our customers and us in such a fashion that our customers are choosing to buy from us or use from us versus our competitor and if we can keep that question always to the front of our minds and keep examining that and not making assumptions about it it many times can help us move along in a in a fashion that at least is somewhat expeditious and and hopefully reduces some of the trial and error but at least gives us a, a, a pathway to follow thank you for that insight Leading on from competition, I'd like to ask you guys, what strategies have you used to market and promote your businesses or the work that you do within your businesses? And how has your marketing approach changed over time? You want me to start, Christina? You can start. If you want to start. Yeah. You know, it's interesting being a marketing company, you, you have to take your own medicine <laughs> and uh, all, all the plans and playbooks we put together for GM and Staples and Dollar General and a bunch of just great brands. Um, sometimes we have to say, wow, let's let's apply it here. Uh, when I look back to uh, our early days, um, it was a sales force. Um, they were called salesmen. Now they're called business development specialists uh, and strategists. Uh, but we we had a, a, an army of, of folks that went around the country uh, visiting corporations. Uh, we did a lot of government work. So uh, we, we spent a lot of time in DC or, or you're attending a conference. And uh, this is a wonderful conference that you all put together, uh, Global Game Changers. And, uh, whether it's virtual or even better when it's in person, um, these sales folks, business development folks have to get out, uh, make introductions, lunches, coffee, uh, attend sessions and, and, you know, start that networking process. Fast forward to today, uh, tech brings lots of opportunities and, and some uh, efficiencies. And, uh, you know, we we're talking a little bit earlier about uh, Gen AI and all. It's at the point now that if you don't do it, you're going to be behind and everyone's going to wind up doing it uh, just to kind of be on par. So when I look at technology and uh, Salesforce, Pardo, all these tools to automate, um, blast out emails uh, and give you reminders on who to follow up with. And, um, and the last part of I'll call it technology helping with your own marketing. Because yes, we want to be on LinkedIn. 
yes, we want to be delivering content, uh, free content, uh, to show the world uh, our expertise um, and to kind of engage uh, potential customers. And there is a, um, a whole practice we have now called account-based uh, marketing, ABM. And it's a whole different, it's six cents and demand base and all these different software tools um, that will help you look at your addressable market, help you kind of target in on what is best for you, uh, get that content out in some kind of automated uh, way, and then have business development specialists. Now you don't need an army of uh, salespeople per se, but uh, once you have a warm lead or someone that got five pieces of your content, you can now have um, you know a, a, a specialist get on the phone and try to arrange uh, some type of uh, appointment. So lots of content, get it out there, and then use some of these uh, ABM type tools uh, to more efficiently, you know, zero in on what's what's going to give you the best return on your time. Thank you for that insight. Um, Nandini, would you like to expand upon the marketing and promotion strategies that are used within the tech companies and how they've evolved over time? Sure. Um, I would say data has been the key all through. Um, even before Gen AI, you know, uh, if you want to do micro-targeting, you use data. Facebook does it, Instagram does it, everybody does it. The challenge I think is, and I'm talking from the enterprise point of view, if you're an Apple, you know which of your consumers are going to line up on the first day and maybe, you know, camp out to get your next iPhone. But if you're an if you're a company like HB and you're trying to come up with a new product and you sell to enterprises, which can be big and small, you don't necessarily know who's going to buy it. And we actually face this challenge. I'm not going to give a lot of details because, you know, a lot of it is proprietary, but just to give you an overview, we are a storage company. We do data storage, what we call on-prem storage. We were coming out with a new product and a solution which would be, quote unquote, a game changer. Now, the challenge is, even though we have hundreds and thousands of customers all over the world, we haven't sold this to a single one of them before. So how do you know who's going to be your early adopter? And how do you know that who's never going to, who's not going to touch it like, you know, five years uh, for the next five years or so? Now, sure, we could, you know, chug a few beers and throw a dart on the wall, but we are more refined than that. So we are not going to go and tell our salespeople to find that needle in the haystack. So we went to data. Fortunately for me, when I was given this task, um, I had access to this wonderful team of data wizards within our company. These are data scientists uh, beyond excellence, and they crush problems like this for like lunch, breakfast, whatever. Hmm. We actually went old school. We uh, use this method called uh, wideband Delphi method. And this was developed in the 1950s in the Rand Corp. So old as gold people, just because it's old, do not throw it away. Now, that method is specifically used for situations like these where you don't have a lot of customer history. So in our case, even though we have hundreds and thousands of customers, nobody has bought this type of product from us before. So how do we predict that if tomorrow we come up with these, these are the maybe 500 people out of the 100,000 who are going to be camping out for this. Who are the ones who are, you know, probably will look at it, try it, but not actually buy it. And who are the ones who are not going to look at it for the next five years? So we worked on it. We gathered 40 plus data points. Now, just because you have 40 data points doesn't mean all of them are relevant. Remember what I said, signal from the noise. Now, there are data points like vertical, which industry the customer is, which, geo, uh, which geography they are located in, which are about as relevant as floppy disk to a Gen Z. Now, things like IT spend, where are, are they spending on public cloud? That's where the gold is. So we spoke with uh, experts within our, uh, you know, uh, Hitachi Ventara group of companies. We have these fantastic salespeople who have their ears to the ground, who have been talking to the customers and who know, you know, anecdotally that there's this um, thirst for this kind of new product that we were launching. Mm -hmm. So we've got their inputs and we separated the signal from the noise. And that's how we came up with a subset of about 500 customers who we called early adopters, 
who we started to pitch uh, this new product. Now, this tool that we developed, uh, we lovingly call it propensity to buy, um, that now has become the gold standard, not only for this new product, but anytime you're trying to you know, sell a new solution or any kind of new version of an old solution, we use this tool to target more effectively. So data is key. Don't be afraid to go back to the old methods because they still work and collaboration. Because if you just look at the data and do not get the context around it, it's not just the quantity, but the quality that is important. So if you can bring those three things together, then you have a good targeting mechanism that can work. Amazing, thank you so much for that. Scott, would you like to build upon and tackle this question from an academic point of view as you're a professor in marketing? Are there any specific strategies that you would encourage up and coming entrepreneurs to implement into their business strategies and journey? Uh, that's a non-trivial question, Beck. I, I think that the question ultimately is how do we how do we stay relevant and applied? And how do we stay as valuable entities uh, throughout our career? And, we, and as we as we continue to work and the context changes, as the industry changes, what does it mean for us as an organization or as a business? And, and how do we address those needs? Are we are we perceiving how the values are are be, are changing uh, with there? And what kind of mechanisms do we have in place in order to to, to have that uh, occur. I think there's a, a valuable exercise and sometimes it happens overtly or sometimes it happens by planning or other kinds of ways. But th the idea of identifying what the value drivers are, that is uh, what do we value as an organization, as a company, uh, as individuals that our customers uh, may deem to be important to them? Is there a series of things that we can do, we can look at. And I think this self-assessment, this organizational assessment that we can go through can help examine it and, and keep us relevant. Now, my, my colleagues here have very, very particular environments and their environments uh, re have very specific requirements as to that. And specifically what those values are that are behind them. And I think it's, and, and clearly both of them understand exactly what is valued or what is the perceived value and what it is that the value that they can also share with others or transmit to others. And to me, that is, that, that's, that's one of the ways of at least being able to establish that the right kind of information. And I think, I think it was, it was just shared that there are really three three kinds of information right there's the kind of information that is relevant we need it for decision making we need it now for decision making then there's the the second tier of information which is well it, it it's probably going to be important at some point and but right now but let's let's just let's put a pin in that and let's keep that but we need to realize that most information is in the third category well it's it's interesting but isn't necessarily something that's actionable or useful or something we can integrate. It's, and, and most of the information is there. And I think it goes back to what you were just saying is that uh, separating the figure from the ground or that which is relevant versus not relevant gets down to sorting out that information because clearly there is a plethora of information out there. As a matter of fact, there's more information that we can probably ever assess or process or deal with. It's a matter of knowing the right information. And I think both my colleagues have done a great job at expressing how they have endeavored to make that happen. Thank you so much. Um, can I now ask you guys to share a pivotal moment or experience that significantly impacted your business development journey or your career path that you're currently in? David, would you like to start? Yes, um, we use we overuse the word pivot around here. And, uh, you know, earlier in my career, there was a pivot every five years and something would change technology, consumer habits. And we would have to, you know, like the, fa the faxes came came as a great marketing tool and left as quickly. 
uh, and uh, we used to do a lot of promotions in shopping malls, and you know they don't get the traffic they used to get. So I see us. Uh, Jim Collins called it kind of firing bullets. We're always trying on a small scale new things that would catch the market. And uh, you know I mentioned cable earlier, uh, but we we met with a couple early cable pioneers that were actually putting up the wiring. And they were talking about going from 12 to 500 channels. And that was a big change. Um, and 24 hour news and sports. So we actually came up with a cable guide to service consumers to figure out what to watch. Uh, they, we probably need one more than ever now for streaming. And uh, we also uh, did some of the early 30 minute infomercials. Because if there's 500 channels, that means there's a lot of open air time and we could do long forms uh, to sell various products. So we, we went into that production. And, uh, and most of, so that was a pivotal moment. And uh, certainly for us, it was around 2006 uh, that we were doing, still doing direct mail and direct response marketing. And clients were telling us about landing pages, like, hey, could you build some traffic? You know, we have some, some new products and we wanna get eyeballs to a landing page and you know, routers and internet availability and high speed was just starting to happen. So the pivotal moment for me is we used to put out CDs and send things in the mail that were really expensive. And then we realized we could take that content and put it on a website or landing page. So that was the light bulb pivotal moment for us that we bet, it's faster, cheaper, uh, more efficient. We better learn about that. And um, which uh, from that moment uh, taught us to get into programmatic, the ability to um, really use uh, dashboards and uh, uh, algorithms to, to target audiences. Uh, and it got us into video, uh, video pre-roll, social, uh, now uh, streaming. So all these things as they emerge and uh, are starting to get, you know, market share, we have to become that expert, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the smartest folks in the room on that new medium. So, uh, so that's the pivotal moment we're going through now. And uh, kind of looking ahead a little bit is, uh, I mentioned third party cookie deprecation. I'm sure some people are applauding that. Uh, but that that was a, a big source of, of uh, we talked a lot about a, a overdose of data and signal from noise. You know, we we relied on that and marketers relied on that. And that's going to eventually uh, dissipate. So what's next? Uh, you're going to hear a lot about retail media networks. Uh, Amazon's the biggest. Walmart's number two. And uh, uh, big uh, retailer brands are, are learning that they can make a lot of money by selling ads on their website and uh, selling uh, a lot of their first party uh, data information and applying it to campaigns and even being able to do full circle attribution saying you, uh, you know, we, we promoted this brand and we could show you the sales that happened in the store. So retail media networks is uh, uh, one part of the new frontier for us and uh, we do have a couple clients uh, working with us and that enables us to learn and then hopefully become somewhat of a industry expert uh, and grow that part of the business. Nandini, Nandini, would you like to share a pivotal moment or experience that impacted your journey within the tech industry? Sure. I mean, it hasn't impacted me so much personally as I think it has impacted the segment of the industry that I work in, which is enterprise. And I think the most pivotal change has been the emergence of public cloud that has caught all the incumbents sleeping literally at the wheel. So if you remember when AWS first started, they started uh, this whole cloud thing by putting their own workloads onto the cloud. Then everybody followed suit, right? And what happened at that time was the enterprise tech companies like Hewlett Packard, like the Cisco's, which used to dominate, they were in this position where, you know, they were still selling gear to their customers. There was this assumption, I think, somewhere at the back of the mind of the execs 
uh, of these companies that, okay, there's so much sunken cost in the customer data centers. They're not going to go away overnight. They did not go away overnight, but we have seen where the market has gone. Like it's literally on-prem has gone like this while AWS has eaten their lunch. I'm just referring to AWS as a proxy for all the other uh, public cloud providers like Azure, sorry, Azure, Google Cloud, et cetera. In fact, Azure is making more gains now than AWS because they have such a huge enterprise footprint. The point is, you know, there might be a, it's not just a new tech that emerged, it's a new business model that caught all the incumbents unaware. The, it, if I were to explain it to a non-technical person, uh, I would say that think about it this way. There was a time when every day you'd go out and get the flour, the meat, the sauce, and make a pizza for yourself. That was your on-prem business. But now you find that, okay, it's cheaper for me if I just order a slice of the pizza or two slices when I need it and pay for it by the, sl uh, by the slice. That's literally what, how cloud works, right? You pay for what you use. You don't have to make these huge investments. That's what gave us companies like Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, because it allowed them to prosper without having to make that a lot of, you know, a capital investment in IT. If that is not your core competency, you don't have to worry about it. Let AWS worry about it. Now, I think there's another trend coming, which we are trying to hopefully latch onto, which is hybrid cloud. So what has happened is if you're, you know, if you're, uh, again, going back to the pizza example, if you're on your own, you're a single lady or a single dude, you order two slices of pizza, makes sense. If you have a family now, you have to order 10 slices. You have to pay for each of those individually. Guess what does that to your pizza bill? It becomes huge, which is what is happening today. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting resistance from the AWSs of the world saying that, okay, it's not like that. And if you uh, see in the VC side, there's this huge um, uh, controversy which happened a couple of years back because Anderson Horowitz, which is one of the leading firms, uh, VCs in, um, in Silicon Valley, they came up with this article saying the trillion dollar paradox of cloud, which what it says is when you look at companies, when you're small, it makes sense for you to keep all your workloads in public cloud because it's cheaper. It allows you to flourish, et cetera. But as you grow bigger, your public cloud bill becomes bigger. So what do you do? It doesn't mean you are going to go and make pizza every day. But what it does mean is you look at your entire IT experience more holistically and say that, okay, it may, because it makes more sense. But if I'm not doing that, then, uh, you, you know, it makes more sense for me to invest in my on-prem or maybe give it to that's how I think the whole repatriation game is happening now where at this point it's the public cloud providers who are on a bit of a defensive I mean it's not a huge trend yet it's still happening but over time I think we will see more and more workloads being brought back from the cloud to on to a hybrid cloud positioning so that the, your overall cloud bill gets uh, uh, gets smaller and more reduced so we can call this, you know, cloud repatriation, uh, smart balancing of workloads, um, whatever we want. But I think it's one pivotal moment, which was the emergence of, you know, let's put everything on the cloud. And the second pivotal moment is let's rethink what we put in the cloud and have a better idea of what should stay in the cloud versus go on prem. And, you know, how you navigate this is, again, not being caught sleeping in the wheel. So hopefully we have learned from the last time and this time we would be um, more, uh, you know, adaptable to it. And I'm proud to say that Hitachi Ventara is really doing a great job. Uh, hybrid cloud is one of the core pillars of our strategy and we are investing in it. And hopefully we want to become the number one hybrid cloud player uh, five to 10 years down the line. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. Um, Scott, I have a very a question very specific to what your talk was about during this summit, but obviously yes. the other panelists are very free to jump in. What role has your passion and commitment played in the development um, of a business journey and how do these two key skills and factors continue to fuel your entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial journey um, and the teaching that you mentor and teach upon your students uh, well there's I, I think probably one of the one of the most important lessons is the one that i continue to 
transmit to my students, or at least hopefully I transmit it. And that is when one is out there in the industry, selling, marketing, doing whatever, and, and, I, and I think David spoke a little bit about this, is that whenever they say no, don't take it personally. <laughs> and so my experience with this is I had a grant from the, when I was working on my PhDs, I, got, I had a grant from the Kellogg Foundation to develop the first visitor behavior evaluation software. So that a zoo or an art museum or some sort of organization like that could collect data on what was going on with their customers, where they valuing the experience that went on. So I, I designed that, I then programmed it, I wrote it, and then uh, I subsequently marketed it. Well, I, I realized at that point when I had sold after a period of time and there had been several articles written about it, about how great it was, and I sold four copies, I realized that I was a much better computer programmer designer than I was a marketer. So I took it on myself to, to say, this is an, obviously an area I needed to augment. So I, I then started to say, oh, I'm gonna be able to investigate and look at and, and examine that and, and maybe make that now one of my strengths. And I think one of the components here, if I could pass something on is perhaps students or anybody needs to try some things as much as possible before they make a judgment about it and see to what degree trying out that new experience, that new activity, perhaps engaging in some learning fits with them. Is it something that they can embrace or love? The idea here is have enough experiences so that one might be able to judge and say, this is my passion. And that's, that's probably one of the clarification things for all of us, either professionally or personally, is to say, here are the things I value in life so much that I can embrace them and that they're part of my, pa they're my passion. And if, if it's my passion, all of a sudden it doesn't become onerous to convey that to others. It becomes a pretty straightforward way of, let me, let me share this with you. Uh, let, me, let me show you how cool this is. Or uh, by, by you participating with us or buying our product or our service or something along those lines, it, here are some of the benefits you're gonna get that kind of a communication is, is just wonderful when it happens. And I think it's a, it becomes consistent with who we are and what we are. There isn't necessarily that separation. Thank you so much. Thank you for all three of you for joining here today at this panel. It's been great to talk to all three of you. Um, if you could just really quickly rapid fire the um, biggest tip that you would give to um, a potential student or a potential entrepreneur that's going to enter the entrepreneurial space, what is the quick fire tip that you would give them? Uh, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, first tip is don't do it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> the fact that you are all on this call and you know learning about this organization and this conference you put on every year, uh, and we have high school and college students uh, on the call, you are, you're off to a fast start. Uh, you, you have a head start. So uh, kudos to you all. Um, this is the land of unlimited opportunity right now. Um, we talked about the pace of pivots. Well, if that is, uh, is at a frenetic level, that means more opportunities are gonna come up and, uh, and ideas can, can be implemented globally. And, there's lots of growing markets uh, to take advantage of. So great time to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I would just, trying to be realistic, only a small percent of entrepreneurial ventures, startups uh, succeed. So I think you have to go into this that uh, if you start as an entrepreneur, it, it's great because you're gonna have to learn all aspects of business, getting funding, uh, learning your customers, going to market, and, and whatever you wind up doing later in life, um, the education will pay dividends uh, forever. So keep that in mind. Um, when you kind of get into the entrepreneurial business, uh, startup business, and you are the owner and you're running it, I like to say you don't work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but you work it 
seven days, 24 hours a day. And that means learning, absorbing, traveling. And there is a, you know, it, it takes a toll. I, I got a notice from American Airlines that I've flown a million miles. It was not fun uh, uh, flying and being away in time zones. Uh, but that's what you have to do. You, you know, even though we're in a virtual world, virtual work world, you have to be out there. So um, my last two bits of advice uh, is take care of yourself uh, mentally and physically. Uh, I was reading about Ray Dalio, who runs a very successful hedge fund, and he's a big uh, transcendental meditation advocate. And uh, so the successful business, uh, resilient business folks are, are doing things uh, to take care of themselves. And the uh, last bit uh, of advice is, you know, it's never too early to give back. Uh, we have a uh, group within Goodway called Goodway Cares, where we kind of reach out and share our expertise and, and funding for uh, local charities. Um, so even if you're not quite successful yet, uh, you don't have to donate money, you can donate time. But I think for your generation, it's going to be very important to um, yeah, sustain yourself and um, start. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, uh, groups, charities, uh, uh, GMOs that, that really need help. And uh, so, you know, find a little time for that as well and uh, certainly enjoy the ride. Thank you so much to all of three of you for joining us today. It has been great to speak to all three of you. And we've come to the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bye. folks. Thank you. Okay, have a good conference.